damn, Kaylin, today I'm looking at Led Zeppelin IV. Led Zeppelin IV was Led Zeppelin's fourth studio album, released November 8th, 1971. And this album initially was just never given a title, well not initially, it was never given a title, but following the theme from the previous three albums, they just decided to name it Led Zeppelin IV. Not they, people did. Personnel is Robert Plant on vocals and harmonica, Jimmy Page on electric and acoustic guitar, and he also produced the album, and J.P. Jones on bass, synthesizers, recorders, and mandolin, and John Bonham on drums. Additional musicians is Ian Stewart, who we talked about in Let It Bleed, and he plays piano on this album, and Sandy Denny, who does co-lead vocal on the Battle of Ever Evermore. But anyway, let's get into, into the recording. <laughs> Around September of 1970, Led Zeppelin stopped, took a break from touring for a little while and retreated to a little cabin in Wales where they wrote basically all of this album. It was recorded from like around December to February, December of 1970, and then to February of 1971 because that is how years work. And it was recorded and mixed primarily in the Rolling Stones traveling studio. Which, if you don't know, is just a van with recordings, like, equipment in it, um, created by the Rolling Stones in 1968, and, like, a bunch of different famous artists recorded in this thing. Bad Company, Dire Straits, The Who, The Rolling Stones, if you could believe it. They also almost recorded this album at Mick Jagger's house. Don't know why I thought that was funny, because it's not really. I just think it is. But yeah, beginning's not a very meaty part of this video. Let's get into the track-by-track track breakdown of Led Zeppelin IV. Track number one is Black Dog. My favorite tidbit I learned about this song while doing research for this album was that the only reason that this song is called Black Dog is because there was just an unnamed dog that walked around the, the cabin where they wrote all the lyrics to this album and they just named they just they called him black dog and so they named the song black dog i'm assuming they called this dog black dog because it was black unless there's an insane plot twist and we find out that this dog is actually orange the call and response format with acapella vocals and then a guitar part was inspired by Fleetwood Mac's 1969 single, Oh Well. Yeah, so to all the old guys that commented on my first Led Zeppelin video about how stinky I was when I said that Fleet, that early Fleetwood Mac was a little like Led Zeppelin, take that. During the call and response parts of the song, the guitar and drum sort of sync up for the first part, and then for the second part, they drift apart into just completely different time signatures, and then they meet them, meet them back up again at the end. That doesn't make any sense when I say it, but if you listen to the song, it does. It's like the guitar goes off course from syncing up with the drums and then meets it again. This is one of two songs on this album that classic rock radio just plays religiously, dude. Like, every other song is just Black Dog or other song. And I think rightfully so. I mean, it's not the best one on this album, but it is a song on this album that is good. Track number two is Rock and Roll. Rock and Roll is the song that Ian Stewart plays piano on. Ian Stewart is a session musician who's played primarily with the Rolling Stones. Apparently, Rock and Roll just started as a jam um, session from like that spun off from playing a Little Richard song and then they added lyrics to it. Yeah, Jimmy Page just liked this jam they had so much that he decided to turn it into a song on the album. And it's formatted like an early 60s or mid to late 50s rock song, like Little Richard, for obvious reasons. Next up is Battle of Evermore. Battle of Evermore is very much an English folk song, and it was heavily inspired by the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, who Robert Plant, like, greatly admired. Like, there are literally direct references to the Lord of the Rings in this song. It's also loosely based on the Scottish Independence Wars, uh, which Robert Plant was reading a book on at the time of writing it. And uh, English folk rock singer Sandy Denny uh, sings co-lead vocals on this song. 
And next up is the song, the god of classic rock radio, and the song that is banned in every single guitar store in the, in the world, Stairway to Heaven. Stairway to Heaven is broken up into three parts. The first part is mostly just vocals, acoustic guitar, and recorders played by J.P. Jones. Second part is sort of a slower electric part, and then the final part is just the, the heavy hard rock, classic rock, long guitar solo part. Everyone either knows the first part or the last part. And there is some controversy on the, like, the writing claims of the song. Apparently the opening chord progression is similar to what, that of a folk song, a very unpopular folk song from the late 60s. And like, even if it, like, it doesn't sound super similar, but, like, even then, it's a pretty common, just, like, chord progression. And I am usually not defending Led Zeppelin on their writing credits, because a lot of the blues stuff is kind of shady, but this is just kind of petty. The argument to me just sounds like, oh, they're using acoustic guitars! Sue them! We use them first! The guitar solo on Stay Right Heaven was played on the classic Jimmy Page 59 Telecaster that was given to him by uh, Jeff Beck um, after he left the Yardbirds. The song was introduced live at a Led Zeppelin concert in like March of 1971 and this was a pretty long time before it was released, just uh, like a few months before it was released um, and people hated it. <laughs> so, but the funny thing is is that it was played at literally every single Led Zeppelin live, sh live show after this album was released. And that's not even like a hyperbole or an overstatement. They literally played it at every single live show unless the show was cut short. And had time to fit it in at the concert that John Bonham died at in 1980. No problem with Stairway to Heaven. It's a good song. I just think it's overrated. <laughs> I think m most people who have heard Stairway to Heaven think that too. The only reason it's so famous is because a disc jockey was bet like a lot of money that he would play Stairway to Heaven on a uh, on his radio station, and then he did, and then people liked him doing that. Led Zeppelin never even released it as, as a single. It literally became this popular because of that one disc jockey. Anyway, moving on to side two. Opening up side two is Misty Mountain Hop. Misty Mountain Hop is also probably based off of Tolkien's work. It's also about a hippie protest in Washington in the late 60s. Whenever people recommend me a Led Zeppelin song, it's always, Misty Mountain Hop is always one of them. And I, I, it's a good song, don't get me wrong, but I really don't get the massive hype over Misty Mountain Hop. It's an okay song. The, the title makes it sound like it's gonna be like a nice folk ballad and it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's okay, it's a good song. It's just not my favorite on this album. Yeah, after that is Four Sticks. Another title tidbit. The title Four Sticks, it was called that because John Bonham used to, uh, during concerts, he'd hold two drumsticks in each hand, and two plus two is four. Plant and Page re-recorded the song in 1972 with the Bombay uh, Symphony, and it was called Four Hands this time, because there was no drums on it, and guitar is the other instrument, I guess. Next up is Going to California. Going to Cal California is like a straight up American folk song. It was heavily inspired by Joni Mitchell's debut album from 1968, A Song for a Seagull, which I talked about a little bit in the Crosby, Stills and Nash video I did. It's actually like one of my favorites on the album. It's underrated, I think. It's, uh, it reminds me a little bit of like, um, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You. And finally, When the Levee Breaks. When the Levee Breaks was originally written and recorded by Memphis Minnie and Kansas Joe McCoy in 1929, and it was written about the 1927 Mississippi floods. And Zeppelin's version compared to the other version, they're both just on opposite sides of the spectrum, because Zeppelin's version um, sort of popularized a niche sort of genre called urban blues, which is just like urban blues. And like the original When the Levee Breaks is like, country like country blues and they're very jarring to hear back to back and the two bar break in the beginning played by john bonham has been sampled by like thousands of hip-hop artists like the beastie boys dr dre and a lot of people including myself consider it 
to be John bon one of John Bonham's best drumming songs. Now that's the track by track breakdown. Now let's get into my thoughts. <laughs> This is my favorite Led Zeppelin album. I said it I said it before in the Led Zeppelin 1 album, but this one is my favorite. The only song I'm not a fan of on this album is Misty Mountain Hop. And I like Misty Mountain Hop too. It's not even like I dislike it. It's just not my favorite. Like usually I won't even skip Misty Mountain Hop. Like so this album is technically a no skip. Also not really my thoughts, but I just feel like I have to say it. This is an original um, copy from 1971 and it's in like pristine condition. Also, I really love the back cover and I don't know why. I personally think that this was the last great Led Zeppelin album. Houses of the Holy was pretty good and then everything out after that was not. Except for physical graf graffiti. I forgot about physical graffiti for a second, but because I kind of grouped that in with the first four. I bet I just made a lot of old people very mad momentarily. But yeah, that was untitled. Led Zeppelin 4. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye, bozos.